Hello and welcome back to uh, this lesson, this third lesson of uh, trigonometry's uh, definitions. And uh, before we go back and discuss the easy math, or it should also, it's not only easy for me, it should also be easy for you. We'll figure, we, I'll, you know, I'll try to um, make it as easier as I can to you, the simple arithmetic of the unit circle, you know, why and how do we figure out what's 3 pi uh, divided by 4, what's 7 pi divided by 6, and uh, the special triangles, right triangles that we're going to use, and how to convert, you know, between all that good stuff uh, before we start digging into each identity, uh, and before we do also the hexagon that help us, you know, uh, dig deeper into all these uh, functions, co-functions, and identities. I just want to relate the whole picture again to you. You remember we started with the tip of the vector, the rotating vector. We started in physics with the vector. Um, and this is the only way we can understand it because when you are in high school, you're going to get sometimes uh, some physics math word problems and they use the sine and the cosine and they use them and some kids get confused. Um, so let's just review, make sure that you ha we have all the pieces of the puzzle where they are and where they belong and where they should be, okay? So let's say if we break up a force into, like we said, into its uh, vertical and this is the force F into its vertical and horizontal component. So we have our Fy and we have our Fx, okay? We're actually, if we want to say it, you know, in, in easier terms, when we break up a force, you know, we, we mean how much force really exists in the vertical direction and in the horizontal direction. So basically Fy, you know, and then is the vertical, of course, direction, the breakup and the vertical and sine, Theta, this is theta, counterclockwise. Sine theta is the absolute value of this Fy, if, you know, divided by the absolute value of the force. If you are to calculate, if you have a physics problem and you're asked to calculate the actual uh, 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 sign, so you need to take, of course, the absolute value, okay? And cosine theta in this situation is the absolute value of f of x, the horizontal breakup divided by f. I believe this is very simple. So far, easy. Now, f is always greater than the absolute value of f of x and f of y, right? That's why the sine and the cosine, they should always be between minus 1 and plus 1. So if you get an answer after taking the absolute value that is greater than one, you should know that you are, there is something wrong, okay? Now, let's say you still have, you're still in, we're still in, in the physics, in the science class, okay? And we have a, a, a force vector that is going like this. They give you F on a coordinate and they tell you this is 4, 3. So the tip of the vector is creating this pair, this ordered pair, on a Cartesian rectangular coordinate plane, and it's 4, 3. So, yeah, you know how to break it up by now. So this is your Fy. You want to show the teacher that, you know, it's a force that you're breaking up. So you put the vector and Fx. But then the question comes, what's the magnitude or the length of this F, meaning the length of the vector? Now, the length of a force in physics is usually sometimes in many books referred to by two vertical bars. It's not the absolute value. So basically, this is your distance distance formula between 0, 0 and 4, 3. Again, distance formula. It's the radical, the square root of x2 minus x1. Okay, let me do it on the board. For those of you who forgot what your... Uh, distance formula is and how is this whole thing is related to math science physics forces okay 
So let's say you just see that in your physics book and they tell you this is F, okay? And it's at the origin, the vertex is at the origin and this is 4, 3, the tip of the vector is at 4, 3. What does that mean? That means that you have a coordinate uh, grid or a Cartesian plane goes like this and then from the tip of the vector you can draw your perpendicular you have your fx and then you have your fy here okay now and then they ask you about or they want you to calculate the magnitude the length of the vector so they tell you what's the length of this vector the length of a vector is usually referred to by with two vertical bars if you put one vertical bar yeah, this is absolute value but so for a length of a vector it's usually two vertical bars okay very similar to the absolute value but it's not the absolute value it's actually the distance formula the distance formula in a coordinate cartesian plane for those of you who have forgot it's the distance between two points. Here we have 0, 0, and here we have 4 and 3. The tip of the vector created this 4 and 3, remember? Okay, so the distance formulas is always the radical, the square root of x squared, uh, uh, or x of 2 minus x of 1, square root, and then the whole thing is squared, plus y of the second point minus y of the first point squared. So f here as the length of this vector equals this distance formula, okay? And if we keep going, what's 4 minus 0? It's 4. Squared is 16. 3 minus 0, very simple, I made it simple here, is of course 3 squared is 9, so it's square root of 25 and it's 5 units or whatever the, uh, the they gave you the centimeter or inches or whatever that is okay now this is that was easy now let's kick it up a notch and let's say let's say they uh let me see here let's say they want to want you to calculate the resulting force so the resulting force is the single force obtained when two or more forces act at a point concurrently. So a resulting force, if you have something like that. So if we have, let's say, F1, this is, we're doing all that to show you, um, just to show you that this is very, you know, not only interlinked, this is, we learn sine and cosine to use it here, okay? So, a resulting force, resulting, you know, it, it's self-explanatory, uh, is the single force that is obtained when two or more forces act at a point concurrently, okay? So, if you have F1 and F2, or let's even make it easier, let's make it like this. The first examples are usually like this. This is F1, this is F2, and your resulting vector is here. This is your resulting vector, okay? Uh, resulting force. So if they give you numbers, if they want you to calculate, they tell you, let's say you have an F1 here, okay? And they ha you have another F2 here, okay? And they tell you F1, that, and you just see that drawn or sketched in front of you on your uh, physics books. They tell you, let's say F1 is 3, 8, and they tell you that F2 is 18 and 2. So, you know, you want to just apply what the teacher, what your physics teacher has taught you, and you come and you say, okay, the resulting force is F1 plus F2 equal total F. Okay, and this is my total F. Okay, and you might get, you know, part of the grade for that, but you need to calculate it. You know, so this resulting vector uh, uh, F is basically F of X plus F of Y. So your F of X is what? They set 3, 8. So basically you're going here. This is your 3 
and the 8 is in the vertical direction. And then for the other one, you have what? 18. Why did I put, why did I start the 18 up on, on top and not on the bottom? This is the thing where some students, you know, uh, uh, are confused. I didn't start the 18 here. Just very careful. Common sense. I didn't start. The 18 should start here. Remember when we, in math, you should consider each vector force at the vertex in order to calculate sine and cosine. So you need to conceptualize that there is a coordinate plane here for this F1, okay? And that's the horizontal part or breakup, and that's the vertical breakup. And then you need to conceptualize that there is another coordinate plane starting here with a vertical component and another horizontal component, okay? So now I can put my 18 here. And for F, it becomes very easy. I cannot, I cannot add up the, uh, uh, for F, the whole thing starts where? This conceptualize X and Y coordinate starts here for this resulting F. So I add my three and my 18 to make it 21 and comma, and I add my eight and my two to make it 10, okay? So again, for each force in math, you need to conceptualize that the force, it's the vertex of this force is at zero. And this way you can add up the resulting uh, forces. Now, let's go to an, an even, um, not more difficult, but more, um, let's kick it, kick it up another notch. Let's say you have two forces again. And instead of using Newton, let's say pounds, two forces, 30 pounds and 45 pounds, okay? And they're like acting or exerting on an object uh, with an angle of, let's say 30, 40, let's make it 60. And we wanna find the magnitude resulting of the resulting force. So you have a 30 and a 45 pound, okay? So let's say this is like this. This is my 30 pound force and this is my 45 pound force and the angle between them is 60 okay and they want to find we want they want you to find the resulting force now this is your f1 and this is your f2 okay now the best way when you have an angle between them and that's of course you're going to learn that in math and in physics is to keep sketching the parallelogram because in this situation the resulting vector is going to be your parallelogram this is your resulting vector right here okay so this is your resulting vector if you call this a point a and let's say this is point b and this is c so vector a b is your resulting vector okay this is the resulting vector joining uh, uh, the two forces, the 30 pound and uh, uh, 45 pounds. Now, the thing is, this is also even related to math and trigonometry in different ways. So again, first we go to simple math or, you know, even I would say elementary school math. If you have an angle and a parallelogram that is 60 degrees on this side. This is 60. What's this angle? Consecutive angle of a parallelogram. It's, they are supplementary. Of course, they're going to make the same way, you know, consecutive angles in a rectangle 90 plus 90 are 180 degrees. Consecutive angles of a parallelogram are supplementary as well. So this one is going to be 120. So now I have this AB and I have this angle being 120, right? So if this angle is 120, okay, now you're going to tell me what, how is that, you know, uh, beneficial to me or how is that going to help me find the length of the resulting vector? I did it in the, in the first one you gave me and that was pretty easy, but this one doesn't really look like that it's easy. Um, 
this is an oblique. We're going to study that in the fifth or sixth session of trigonometry. This is an oblique triangle. And uh, the laws of sine and cosine, they don't only fit a right triangle. They also fit oblique triangle. They fit all kind of triangles. And so when you have an angle that is, let's say here, it's 120 degree, you know the two sides and the angle between them, then we can use something called the laws of cosine. I'm just giving you an example. You don't need to know it now. We didn't define it yet, okay? And you're going to ask me, what do you mean I know that? Yeah, you know the two sides. You know that this is 30 pounds and this is 45. So this is 45, right? Uh, the parallel side of a parallelogram. So I have 30, 45, and I know the angle between them. And the laws of cosines, once you know two sides and the angle between them, it's very easy. You go, you know, this, let's call this side C, and this is, you know, I don't know, maybe B, small b, and this is small a. You say C squared equal A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine, that's the law of cosine, of the angle between A and B, cosine theta here, okay? So C squared, the resulting vector here, this is your AB, C squared as magnitude, okay? So we want AB, remember magnitude, we put two vertical bars equal your C squared here. Let's keep going. So you're not supposed to know it now, I'm just giving you an example how everything relates together before we go back to the unit circle and this, to the special triangles. So C squared or the resulting vector or AB squared equal uh, the first side 30 squared plus 45 squared minus 2 times 30, 45 and cosine of 120. Now what's cosine of 120? This is what I'm gonna... Uh, first of all, what's 30 squared? Even if you're allowed to use a calculator, you don't need a calculator here in the beginning, maybe at the end. It's 900. What's 45 squared? You're going to tell me, I don't know that. Yes, you need to know stuff like that. You can do it like this. Distributive property, elementary school. And then you 45 times 4, you know, 180. 1800 plus 225. So this is 20, 2025 minus again you can do the same thing here 30 times 40 plus 5 and you're gonna get 2 times 2 so 1350 okay or 2 times 100 2 times 100 1350 what's cosine of 120 all this this one you should know because we already did that Sorry about that. Let's go back here. This one you should know. Cosine of 120. So it's in quadrant two. This is when you don't, when it's not in quadrant one, when it's not an easy one. Cosine of 45, cosine of 30, cosine of 90, cosine of 60. It's cosine of 120. What do we do? First, we, you know, figure out which quadrant we're in. We're in quadrant two. Okay, so that's 120. So I need to find out the tip of the vector that's going to create a reference triangle and a reference angle for me. What's the reference angle? 60. What's a cosine of 60? Cosine of 60 is a half, but it's in quadrant 2, meaning this is minus x. So the, the horizontal breakup is negative, so that's minus a half. Very simple. Okay, so if we figure out which quadrant we're in, we find the reference angle, the reference right triangle, and then we just need to figure out is the sine positive or negative here is the cosine positive or negative here depending or where is that horizontal or vertical breakup so going back here times two times minus a half so this becomes a plus and if we add them up you can use a calculator now and add them up 4275 so that's c squared or the length of this resulting vector a b squared so if i want just the length of the vector i need to take the square root of 4275 and i don't know this one here you yes you do need a calculator 
four pounds and this is how you find it 65.4 pounds so see how everything is linked very pretty much linked together and super the last thing we're going to talk about before we hit back and study the Sokatoa and the special triangles and the magical hexagon in in physics in many of your physics books you also start with the velocity and uh you know the definition of a velocity the velocity basically if you open your um, uh, dictionary it means uh, when a vehicle or an element gains or has the capacity to gain speed within a very short period of time so it's basically in physics it's your rate of change in velocity that gives you the acceleration okay so acceleration when you accelerate acceleration equal the rate of change in velocity divided by the rate of change in time okay so the definition of acceleration which is you know uh, uh, which started with the initial velocity uh, is when a an element or a vehicle can accelerate when it has the capacity to gain a speed within a very short period of time so that's why most of these formulas come from calculus for those of you who know calculus i'm just making it not difficult i'm not overwhelming you but i'm just telling you how is that thing related to even calculus differential and integral calculus okay so for those of you who have started calculus they know what i'm talking about so basically instead of saying rate of change in velocity divided by rate of change in time the time is very very short so delta t goes to zero so here i can use d differential of v divided by dt so if i'm starting with an initial velocity v0 and i can break it up into a vy and a vx like this okay basically i can also find you know uh, here if it's going in a projectile like this let's say it's a basketball or a projectile your v0 goes like this this is your v0 right and then now here this is your velocity and you can you can break it up into vx and vy that's all i wanted to tell you this is your vy of course it's the projection of vy so vy becomes v times sine theta and vx is v times cosine theta okay cosine theta v equal uh, uh i'm sorry vx vx equal v times cosine theta why are you telling me all that um i'm not i'm telling you all that just for you to imagine how everything is linked together you cannot forget this is your v0 and here we broke down the velocity into vx and vy and we said vx equal v cosine theta because remember cosine theta equal the horizontal component divided by the total vector and vy equals v times sine theta because sine theta equal the vertical component or breakup divided by the whole vector now what happens here this is what you study that actually in math and in physics in grade 10 and 11 here your v what what happens here Z vy equals zero there's no vy here vy equals zero and here at right at, on top vx equal v cosine of the uh, zero what's cosine of the zero it's one okay because the angle is zero okay the angle right here on top is zero so vx is v time cosine of, of 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 zero which is one so vx equal v and vy equals zero because vy equal v times sine of z uh, uh, sine of zero is zero so that's why there is no vertical component so that's why 
right here when you have let's say an upside down parabola and you're studying the velocity velocity v is going to be equal vx there is only a horizontal component to it okay and of course the final one your vy would be in the negative direction like this vy going in this direction this is just to link everything together we're gonna get to these and we're gonna uh do some problems with the velocity and you know how we use sine and cosine with forces and especially with velocity and acceleration but just keep that in mind that even when you're studying a vector on top of a parabola that is upside down right on top at that point on top at the maximum or maximum v there is only a horizontal component because the actual amount of rotation the angle is zero and since vx equal v times cosine of the angle which is zero equals that's vx equal v there is only a vx and vy is going to be equal v times sine of zero which is zero okay so there's no vy there is no horizontal uh, uh, vertical breakup okay now now we're gonna go back and start slowly with our unit circle our sokatoa and our uh, magical hexagon which for me actually is um um i find it to be um more interesting than the sokatoa here let's switch back and let's go to the board and just show you why a hexagon, a TSC hexagon, is more important than your Sokato. Okay. First of all, it's a hexagon. Okay. So six sides, and uh, you can call it whatever you want. I call it TSC instead of remembering Sokato. I call it TSC. T for tangent, uh, S for sine, and C for cosine. So if I'm drawing it this way. And I'm gonna start with the T. The only thing I need to remember is that I put the T here, tangent, T. And then S for sine. And then C for cosine. Now in front of the T, I put the co-function of the T, which is the cotangent. Now how do I know that the cosecant goes here and the secant goes here? I know because secant, lingu linguistically, it means last. And cosecant means next. So if this is the last, then this is the next to the last, and the cosecant and the secant. Now I join the vertices, and they all meet at 1. Remember, they all get to meet at 1. Because, simply because what? Because a sine and a cosine function, they're always between minus 1 and plus 1, okay? So now, having said that, let's draw it on our tablet here. And let's figure out some identities and some functions and co-functions, okay? So all you need to remember is TSC, T for tangent. S for sine, C for cosine, and the cofunction of the tangent is cotangent, so it goes on the opposite side of it. And secant in uh, linguistically it means last, so this is your secant. This is your cosecant. It means cosecant means next, so next to last. And then you jo join the vertices. They meet in the middle at where one is now if you go clockwise what do we get we start with the simple you know tangent let's go clockwise you can go both clockwise and counterclockwise that's the beauty of it and we can figure out a lot of so if i go clockwise t tangent equal sine divided by cosine okay very simple i keep going I can go keep going this way now. I go sine of theta of alpha equals what's after sine? Cosine. So cosine divided by cotangent. For simplification, this is great. Let's say I'm here. 
I'm, I'm not at the cotangent. I'm at the secant here, the, the last one. So what's secant? Secant theta or x. Keep going clockwise. Secant equal tangent divided by sine. So equal tangent divided by sine. Wow. Okay. Now let me, let's sketch it again. And let's try to go counterclockwise. Excuse my hexagon. You know, it's not the best hexagon, but you got the picture. So TSC, T S cosine, cotangent, cosecant, and secant. Now I'm going counterclockwise. So I'm going this way. Okay. So if I go cosine this one here, and I'm going this way, what's cosine? Cosine theta, cosine alpha equals sine. What's after the cosine? Sine divided by tangent. Okay. If I go uh, sine, sine equal tangent divided by what's after tangent going this way? The tangent divided by secant. Okay. And so on and so forth. Now, this is great because, you know, you don't need to memorize any of that. There is even more. Look at that. Now, if you want to go through the one, you tell me, what do you mean? Yes, we can not only, we can go through the one. Look at that. So if I am to go through the one here, again, TSC, that's all I need to remember. TSC. Cotangent, cosecant means next to last, secant means last, and one is in the middle, okay? So, if I am to go from uh, uh, sine to, cos uh, to cosecant, from here to here, this way, this direction, okay? So, what do I do? What's after sine? It's one. It's one divided by cosecant. So, those are your reciprocal identities. So sine theta equal one divided by cosine, uh, cosecant the, uh, theta. And if I am to go from cosine to secant, I have to go cosine theta or alpha or x equal one. One is first divided by secant. So this is how I know that the cosine is linked to the secant, not to the cosecant, although they start with the same. Some, kid, uh, some uh, students, they confuse that. Okay. Now, if I am to go to uh, do my uh, cotangent, cotangent equals one divided by tangent. And if I am to do my, let's say tangent, tangent equals one divided by cotangent. So I got all my reciprocal identities, okay? Now there's more, you can get the product identities. What do you mean by that, sir? Okay, that's, look at this TSC, we didn't memorize anything. Not even one single formula. Look at that. Again, all you need to remember TSC, tangent, sine, cosine, cotangent, secant means last, cosecant means second to last. Join them, put a one in the middle. Okay, this is your one right here. Now, product identities. Tangent times, let's say, uh, uh, cosine equal what? What's in between them? Exactly, sine. So if you want to find, you know, a product identity, you should look, where is that function? It's between what, what other two functions? It's a function is between two other functions. There's a sine theta is equal tangent theta times cosine theta, okay? because it's between the cosine and the tangent. Now, if you want to find out another one, let's say you want to find out, um, uh, um, let's, I don't know, uh, the, the tangent here, let's, let's do it this way. One, one is right here in the middle, right? So one equal what? tangent theta or tangent x times cotangent theta or cotangent x, okay? And one also equal what? You can, you look, one is also between sine and cosecant. One equal 
sine theta times cosecant theta. And one is also equal secant theta times cosine theta. Okay, so this is your, uh, uh, we call it the product identity. So, so far we got the, the clockwise, the counterclockwise, we got the product identity. And from the product identity, you of course get your quotient or they call some, in some books they call it quotient identity. Meaning if sine theta is equal to tangent theta times cosine theta, then you can say that tangent theta, of course, equals sine theta divided by cosine theta, okay? Now, there is even more to that. You can also get your um, uh, uh, co-function. What do I mean by this? Yeah, your co-functions, let's draw it again. TSC, that's all you need to remember, not even memorize. Just remember your TSC hexagon and you're fine. T sine, cosine, cotangent, secant at last, cosecant is next to last, and one is in the middle, okay? Co-function, remember the, the cotangent is the co-function of the tangent. We, when we sketch and when we, gonna, well, when we are going to draw these function, you will understand exactly what that means. And the sine in the co, uh, the cosine is the, um, it's across, it's on the other side. It's the co-function of the sine. And the cosecant is the co-function of the secant. So basically, if I want to find sine theta, that's cosine of 90 degrees minus theta. This is what I meant by this, okay? So if you have, that's an example of this would be uh, sine of 30 degrees, which is one half equal cosine of 90 minus 30, which is 60. So sine of 30 equal cosine of 60. So those, we call those co-functions. And I know that because they're right across from each other. And we're going to study them more as we go. But if we forget how we, we're going to derive them also, and I'm going to show you how we get to that. But, you know, if, if just in case you forgot, the same way we used our arrows to go clockwise and counterclockwise, and we used our arrows to go through that product uh, identity and say that one uh, equals tangent uh, times cotangent, the same way we can do this, we can go from sine to cosine and tangent to cotangent. We can also say that tangent theta equal cotangent of 90 minus theta, okay? And we can say also something like uh, secant, because the secant and cosecant are also co-functions, secant uh, theta equal cosecant 90 minus theta. So if you have secant, let's say 40 degrees, that equals cosecant of what? 90 minus 40, 50 degrees, okay? So that's how we figure them out. We're gonna study them in details and we're going to derive them and you're going to understand exactly why sine of theta equal cosine of pi over 2 or 90 minus theta but uh let's remember that they are co-functions and then you can you know find them out inside that uh magical hexagon by going from one end to the other they're across, sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant, okay? Now, what else? Uh, let me see, can we get anything else out of this? Yes, we can get one more actually. Here, um, let me show you this. Here. I apologize if my hexagon, I'm not really good at drawing and sketching. That's why I like this grid because here, cosecant is next, secant is last. Again, joining the vertices, they join at one. Now, look at this. We can go to one like this. Sine squared now of theta plus cosine squared theta equals what? One, we get to one. <laughs> and look at this. 
okay? Going clockwise around any of uh, these three triangles. So you have three triangles. You have this triangle here, this triangle here, and this triangle here. Remember, if this one you probably gonna remember it the most but you know these two remember that you can use these two triangles here we're gonna explain how we got to these but remember that you can use them if you forget you know the this one we use it a lot one plus cotangent squared theta equal cosecant squared theta okay and the last triangle you can use is this one so basically tangent squared theta plus one equal secant squared theta okay let me put it on the board and after that we're gonna also put our unit circle we're gonna end up with it because the unit circle is our yeah let's go here let's go to the board put this for you on the board okay we're going to study all these in details, but for now, just remember that in addition to going counterclockwise, I'm sorry, clockwise, counterclockwise, going through like this with an arrow, right? And saying this is the product identity, one equal, what, sine times cosecant, and one equal tangent times cotangent okay you can also go inside three triangles if you ever forget and one of them we use a lot this one and this one and this one okay so you probably sine squared this is for the squared function sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equal your one you get the one this one we don't use a lot one squared which is one plus cotangent squared theta equal cosecant squared theta however this one is used a lot and you see it in a lot of simplification and we need it a lot tangent squared and many i forget it sometimes and i go back here okay tangent squared theta plus one equals what what do you get to secant squared theta now we're gonna explain it, we're gonna say where it came from and how did we get to it. However, if we ever forget it, if we're overwhelmed, if we blank, if we are doing, you know, taking a test, just remember your TSC, I can use, in addition to all the other uh, formulas that I was able to uh, figure out without memorizing, I can figure out this one, tangent squared, I can use the three triangles, tangent squared plus one squared equal secant squared, okay? Now, Having said that, the last thing I'm going to start with, and we're going to finish it off in the next lesson, is the simple unit circle, because we're going to be able, here, let's see here, we're going to try to be able to um, convert very easily, okay, between radiant, so if this is my Okay. And degrees. Okay. So of course this is my zero. This is my pi over two or ninety. And you all know your middle line here that cuts you in pi over 4. I hope you know that. This is your 45 degrees, okay? And then you have your pi over 6, which is 30 degrees. And then you have your 60, which is pi over 3. Now, one of the... Uh, you know, one of the tricks or one of the ideas or one of the helpful hints that will help you figure out how to convert between a radian and a degrees is to always, you know, uh, conceptualize pi as 180. 
Okay, because when you have 180, it's basically you're, you're doing a multiplication or a division by 18. And if you know your 18 uh, a chain, and if you know arithmetic, and if you study with me, and if you go through those riddles and operations to keep your, you know, your brain uh, very, um, the calculator, the arithmetic calculator in your brain very vigorous and very uh, lit all the time, then just figure it out this way. 180 divided by 3, that's 60 degrees. 180 or 18 divided by 6, this is your 3, your 30 degrees. Now, when we go to second quadrant, you know, you're going to tell me, okay, now I'm going to the second quadrant, it's getting more difficult. It's not getting more difficult. All we need to do The numerator is going to get a little bit, you know, larger, okay? However, the numerator is not going to be more than the denominator until you pass that 180. So here, in the second quadrant, you're going to get the first one that we, we use a lot is your 120. Or, you know, in arithmetically, you know, it's... 12 okay so what's the number that i do times 18 and then i can divide it by a 3 or a 4 or a 6 and get 12 okay this is how i usually think about it so that's why it's your 2 pi over 3 2 times 18 is 36 36 divided by 3 is 12 so this is your 120 degrees okay now, the next one, we use these a lot. So, yes, you can, you know, try to sketch them on a piece of paper and figure them out. But the more you train your brain to uh, 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 remember them quickly, the faster you can go through them and the faster you can solve the easy problems and get to the, you know, the harder math word problems. The 135 degrees is, again, you go up a notch. It's 3 pi, not 2 pi, but over 3. Why? Because if you know your 3 times 18 is 54, and 54 divided by 3, what's 54 divided by 3? It's 2 times 27. Again, it's 13.5. So that's why this one is 135 degrees. Those are, if you just started studying with me, those are the math riddles and math operation and the simple arithmetic that you should train your brain with. This is one of the main one every day. 3 times 18 is 54 or 540 if it's 180. And you know, what's, you know, what's the answer? It's 54 is 27 times 2. So half of that, you know, and, and uh, dividing it because it's divisible by 4, Dividing it another time is 13.5, so it's 135, okay? Okay, the last one we're going to do, we're going to leave the rest for next time, is your 150. Your 150. 150 is, you know, I'm going again, one more. So I'm going to go 5 pi over 6, this one. 5 pi over 6, okay? See how I have the 6 here and the 6 here? That's why I divided by 6, okay? And then 3 here and 3 here. Pi over 3, 2 pi over 3. Pi over 4, 3 pi over 4. Pi over 6, 5 pi over 6. What's 5 pi? 5 times 18 is your 90 or 900. Divided by 6 is your 15 or 150, okay? Again, these things, you need to exercise them by yourself. They help you a lot. Now... When you are at 3 pi divided by 4, 135, let's say this is your angle, your standard angle, okay? What's your reference angle? You take the tip of the vector again, and you draw the perpendicular, and there you have it. You have a new reference right triangle, okay? And if the standard angle or the angle we're interested in is 135, what's left? What's the, this, what's the angle between the terminal side what we learned in the previous lesson and the x-axis, it's 180 or pi minus 3 pi divided by 4 or 180 minus 135, which is 45 degrees. 
So if you're trying to find the sine of 135 degrees, it's going to be the sine actually of 45 degrees, okay? And since you are in quadrant one, it is the sine. The, the, the sine, uh, 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 positive sine doesn't change. It stays positive. It changes for the cosine, okay? We're going to leave the rest for uh, the next lesson. However, let me tell you that here, after you cross the 180, you're going to go into, you know, a number in the numerator larger than the number in the denominator. Forgetting about pi. So here I'm going to go into 7 pi over 6. And if you, again, if you know your simple arithmetic, what's 7 pi? 7 times 18. Anyone? Lisa? Let me see. 126. And 126 divided by 6. 120 divided by 6. 20. And 6, you get the 1. So it's 21. So it's 210. Okay? So these little things, if you train your brain every day with the unit circle, helps you a lot with a lot of things. Okay? So this is your... 7 pi divided by 6. Now you see how that pattern continues? We're going to find a division by 6 here. And in the middle, we're going to do a division by 4. Okay? And here, we're going to do a division by 3 here and here. Okay? I'll leave that for the next uh, lesson. And I will see you most probably tomorrow. Thank you, guys.